This is the lecture for Tuesday, the 11th of May, 2021, for European history. Where we are is in the middle of the, one of the most universal lessons uh, that I teach. And I teach everything from creation up to the present moment in the two classes, ancient and Europe. The lead up to World War II is timely because the world is always faced with aggressors. The people who come to lead most of the world's countries are not the smartest. They are not the nicest. They are not the most generous. They are not those who care most for others. People who end up leading most of the world's nations most of the time are the most aggressive, the most effective at pressuring, intimidating, using violence to get their way. Those are the people that take power. No, I say take power. They're not given it. They take it. Because for them, power is a reward of will. Hitler was glorified in a 1934 movie made by Elie Riefenstahl. And I love it when feminists talk about uh, prominent Nazis as great women pioneers. Uh, Lenny, I'm sorry, Leni Riefenstahl, one of the great filmmakers of Nazi Germany, a woman. Uh, they also talk about, her name is Hannah Rausch, who was uh, a pilot. Uh, and she um, was one of the first helicopter pilots in uh, the world. Uh, for the Nazis experimenting with their autogyro program. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, among earliest women, but also close friends of Hitler um, and uh, true believing Nazis. Lenny Riefenstahl's movie, Triumph of the Will, chronicles the 1934 Nuremberg rally, which is the annual Nazi party rally that was held in Nuremberg, Germany. Um, Nuremberg at that time being a city that was that had retained a lot of its medieval buildings, a lot of its medieval charm, uh, a city that was glorified by Wagner and the Meistersingers of Nuremberg, and a uh, city that in many ways embodied the heart of Germany. Her movie was called Triumph of the Will, which is a Nietzschean phrase that talks about how the Superman, the Ubermensch, will take apotheosis, almost like Satan trying to storm the gates of heaven, that a superman has among, actually more than any other quality, an indomitable will, and that that willpower will shape the world to suit its needs. It is that notion that power of any kind over others comes from the exertion of willpower and the cultivation of one's capacity to dominate others, either through beguiling, as in the case of Hitler with his oratory, or through intimidation, as in the case of most communist regimes, or in the case of actual physical suppression, uh, as is going on right now in Xinjiang province in China with the Uyghur population or with the Jews during the Hitler regime, both before and after uh, and during the final solution. The key is to dominate others. And to dominate others, ultimately what you need to do is have a clear desire to do so, an untrammeled, uncomplicated unreflected upon desire to dominate and control, and a willingness to devote all of your efforts to expand <laughs> the techniques and tools that you have at your disposal to bend others to your will. Why are there so many people interested in dominating others? Why are there so many in people interested in, in dominating the world? Well, among other things, there's the simple psychological truth that if you're focused on the problems of others, you can ignore your own. Rules for thee, but not for me. 
I'm equal to the best of you and better than the rest of you. I judge all, but no one judges me. That notion to place yourself outside of the rest of humanity and to view the rest of humanity as the canvas upon which you will paint, which is how Hitler viewed it, being an artist. Or as Stalin viewed it, being the best worker, the hardest worker, the most ruthless worker, to dominate all the other workers, to outwork your opponents, to outdetail your opponents, to outfox your opponents by making them underestimate you. All of those brilliant ideologues, those brilliant philosophers, those brilliant thinkers who were around Lenin when he took power in Russia, Stalin made sure they all paid. He succeeded Lenin, not them, because of his will power, which made him harder working than anyone else. There are people like this around us today. There may be people like this growing up around you in this school. You never know. If a bum from Vienna can end up coming this close to taking over the world, anyone can. The flaw of the notion of aristocracy is that power and majesty and wisdom come from certain bloodlines. It's not true. This kind of lightning can strike anywhere, can strike anyone. All you have to do is say yes to it. And if you're there, the right person at the right moment of history, doing the right things, you can leverage your willpower and make a lot of history. And there are people who want to do that. And you, my students, my friends, my fellow citizens, Will be cannon fodder in their armies, you will be grist in their mill, you will be resources to be expended. <laughs> and all the dreams that you have about running your life your way, making your future dreams come true, will be for naught because they'll take you and they'll use you if you let them. If we let them, evil exists. It exists in people. And if you ignore it, do so at your peril. Part of being an adult is recognizing that there is danger without letting it destroy your life. And spending some of your time learning enough about it to resist it so that you can be a useful person in the struggle between good and evil. And the wonderful thing about this is I don't have to prove any of this to you unless there's something very different about your mind. You'll see it. You've already seen it. You're old enough to have encountered it. The most common way is with bullies or with somebody in your family that isn't quite right or somebody in the neighborhood. You've seen it. You've met it. And you will do so again. So how we face evil, how we face aggression, how we face those people who have given half a chance will take everything that you have, your freedom, your life, your talents, and use it for their purposes without feeling the slightest iota of guilt. That's something that's a universal. What happened is that this story is writ large in the lead up to World War II in Europe. Again and again, the good people of the world, the peace-loving people of the world, the people of Western democracies, 
the people who believed in the League of Nations, the idealists. Again and again, they had a chance to stop Hitler before he became too powerful. Again and again, they failed to do so. For different reasons, but with one common theme in mind. The domestic enemies of Hitler would have had to risk death, risk defamation, which is the destruction of reputation, risk their families in order to fight Hitler once he gained a certain amount of power. And most people don't want to do that right now. <coughs> and in the international community, which is something that the anti-Nazi Germans begged and begged and begged God would intervene and do something about this because they had failed to. The international community didn't want another war with Germany. Period. <clears throat> so everything was done to prevent it. Good intentions. Road to hell. Germany rearms. The West does nothing. Germany marches into the Rhineland. France retreats. The West does nothing. Germany absorbs Austria. Days before a plebiscite would allow the Austrians to make their own choice. The world does nothing. Now we come to the height of quintessential moment of appeasement, the Sudeten crisis with Czechoslovakia that leads us to the Munich Conference <coughs> of September 1938. Like with Austria, Hitler is claiming that there is a persecuted German minority in the Sudetenland mountain region surrounding the Czech regions of Bohemia and Moravia, that the Czechs are abusing the German population with everything from rape to arson to theft to assault to murder to forbidding German culture and German language to be taught in schools to children, raising Germans as Czechs. And that the only justice that can come from this is for the German population to be placed within Germany because Hitler claims dominion over all Germans, everywhere, wherever they are in the world. If the Czechs give up the Sudetenland, which has all their fortresses against Germany, which has most of their arms industry, Germany will be satisfied. But if Czechoslovakia does not give these things, Germany will act, and will act decisively. The drums of war are being beaten. And as the summer of 1938 heads to September, it looks more and more like war will come. What to do? Well, the Czechs are not in a bad position. The Sudeten frontier is mountainous and fortified. The Czech military, though small, is well-armed well and, uh, and, and well-trained, and they'll be highly motivated to defend their homes. The Czechs have an ironclad alliance on paper signed with France and Britain absolutely requiring France and Britain to come to Czechoslovakia's aid if they are invaded. Even the Soviet Union, which at that time had no common frontier with Czechoslovakia, says, if the fascists come, let us help you. Now this is Stalin. This is like a tiger saying, let me into your chicken coop, your chicken garden, your chicken yard. 
Let me in, and I'll protect your chickens from the uh, fox in the hen house. It's a tiger. You probably don't want to let it in with your chickens. Because tiger, its nature is to consume things like chickens and chicken farmers. So the Czechs are not so happy about the notion of letting Soviet troops and the Poles and the Hungarians, who actually control the space between Czechoslovakia and Soviet Russia, are not going to let Russian troops into their territory either. Because once you let Russian troops in, you're not going to get rid of them. Still, the Russians are friendly because they're worried about the Germans. So if war comes, Czechoslovakia should be able to hold pretty strongly the Sudeten line against the Germans. Meanwhile, the West will go to war, and that means that Germany alone will be fighting aggressively to break through the mountain frontier of Czechoslovakia, and defensively against the French and, French and British in the West. And this is 1938. It's a year before Hitler thinks himself really ready for war. So, if war comes, it looks to be a war that Germany does not have a great advantage in. If war comes, it should be a medium-sized, European conflict, and ultimately, if Czechoslovakia holds and Britain is able to transmit its power into France like it did in World War I by moving its armies over, the British and the French may be willing and able to move through the Maginot Line and into Germany. They'll blockade Germany. They could bomb Germany. Even the Russians may help. Heck, the Poles and the others, who are German neighbors, might get involved. It doesn't look like a bad prospect, except, except that it's war. It's another war with Germany. And look at what happened the last time. The only people who profited were the merchants of death. What came out of the trenches was the Spanish flu and totalitarianism. Do we want to consign another generation of young men, the sons of the very soldiers of the trenches, to serve in a new line of trenches? Do we want the horror stories of H.G. Wells and Olaf Stapleton, the science fiction writers, to come true? They were all predicting what a Second World War would look like. They didn't think that anyone would have time to get to the trenches. Because what H.G. Wells, in his book, Things to Come, and Olaf Stapledon, in his book, um, First and Last Men, what they predicted was typical of what people feared. When war is declared, air fleets, bomber aircraft, filled with mustard gas, would take off from both sides pass each other in a somber moment, salute each other, go over each other's cities, and just bomb and bomb and bomb with mustard gas until every civilized place was depopulated. To fight this, gas masks were issued, but gas masks alone are not enough to fight mustard gas because it's an airborne acid, it's a blistering agent, and on top of that, there exist gas chambers for infants that are like a little cylinder you put your baby in and you just pump the ends like a bellows and that breathes for the baby in and out. It breathes the air and supposedly filters it. It's a world where you need a chamber to hide an infant from the poison gas. All of the science fiction writers predicted the death of human civilization, a dark age like we've never experienced, and maybe the death of the species, maybe the death of most species, a mass extinction event. 
Who wants that? Right now, who wants global thermonuclear war? I don't. So, in the West, the Prime Minister of Britain, Neville Chamberlain, decides that he's going to be a hero. He is personally going to fly to Germany to meet with Herr Hitler. He is going to try to negotiate a way towards peace. He goes without a retinue, without advisors, into Hitler's domain. And his efforts lead to the Munich Conference. Munich's here, the capital of Bavaria. Hitler will be there, representing Germany. Mussolini will be there, representing Italy. France will be there, led by Premier Deladier. And Chamberlain will be there, representing Britain. And those four powers will find a way forward to keep the peace. Note who's not there. Us. Well, we're not there, but we're isolationists. That's true. Russia. Russia's not there because they're communists and nobody trusts them. <laughs> and for good reason. Uh -uh. Uh -huh. No checks! It's like the opposite of trail mix. Because there's no checks involved. <laughs> the fate of Czechoslovakia, no checks, but... which involves their shield, the Sudetenland, is to be decided without any Czech representation. It's a reference to Czech mix, which is often the basis of trail mix. Okay. You get some wheat checks, some nuts, some raisins. You go out camping, and yeah, that's that's it. That's so funny. Well, now you now you know about camping. You can also bring a good can of Dinty Moore stew. That's that's fun. Just put it on the fire and watch it pop. So, in September of 1938, the Czechs, who have an ironclad agreement, watch in horror as, as the British and French negotiate. The next, uh, the, the, the morning after the conference, Chamberlain flies back to England. And at Croydon Airport, south of London, he steps off the plane and waves a piece of paper in the air. This piece of paper bears the signature of Herr Hitler and of myself. It contains an agreement that I believe will grant us peace in our time. The agreement sells out the checks. As he's waving his piece of paper and talking about peace and riding into London to the tumultuous roar of adulating crowds, as the king goes to 10 Downing Street to appear with Chamberlain as the man who keeps the peace. Chamberlain is at the height of his popularity when he does this. German tanks have crossed the frontier and occupied the Sudetenland. The Czechs are confused. They do not resist because... At this point, what's the point? They've just been backstabbed by the people who had promised to protect them. And it's over, almost before it begins. In return for allowing the Germans to absorb the Sudetenland, Chamberlain has a promise on that piece of paper, paper that the Sudetenland is the last territorial claim that Hitler will make. 
that he will be satisfied with that and won't demand anything else. Peace in our time. Chamberlain is so absolutely certain that he is the only one who could bring the peace. He has dragged the French kicking and screaming because they're terrified Britain will leave them alone on the continent with Germany. The Czechs are ignored. Domestic opposition like Winston Churchill, who calls this the blackest day in the history of the British nation because we have sold out our neighbors to preserve an illusion of peace. Chamberlain is still hailed as the man who brought us peace in our time. So Germany absorbs the Sudetenland. Six months later, they take the rest of Czechoslovakia. The Czech lands are absorbed into the Greater Reich. Slovakia becomes a protectorate, and Poland is paid off with territory from Slovakia. This is in March 1939, when Hitler does this. And Chamberlain the seems, seems to wake up. He redoubles efforts to build Britain's air force and armed forces. And Hitler, as he's doing this, is demanding Danzig and the Polish corridor. <clears throat> Chamberlain, who feels personally humiliated, by Hitler lying to him and using him and making a fool of him, which he does, says to the world, if Poland is attacked, Britain will go to war. So will France. Because France at this point, again, is desperate not to be left alone on the continent of Europe with Germany. So Chamberlain makes a promise to Poland the same promise that 20 years before had been made to the Czechs. Why anyone should believe him is an open question. The Poles are nervous. Hitler wants this territory back. Hitler wants Danzig. That will cut Poland off from the sea. It will also set a precedent. Because if you give the wolf a snack, you're inviting him to come back for more. Once you have paid him the Dane Geld, you'll never get rid of the Dane. The Soviets are sick of the West. They see the West as a group of credulous fools. So in August of 1939, the world is shocked when a treaty, this is late August, 1939, a treaty of peace is announced and friendship and mutual assistance between Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. The Hitler-Stalin Pact or the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, named after the foreign ministers, or the Nazi-Soviet Pact, is signed, and it stuns the world, because everyone thinks that the Nazis and communists hate one another, because as long as they've existed, Nazis and communists have hated one another. This is why people think that. Because battles in the streets, uh, Stalin and fighting the uh, Nazis and fascists in Spain, um, the Communist International versus Hitler's plans, everyone says that the opposite of communism is fascism. On the ideological scale, it's just more of the same. It's more totalitarianism. But in the late August of 1939, all of that is forgotten. Suddenly, Hitler and Stalin are bestest buddies. You know who should get really nervous? The people between Hitler and Stalin. Everyone 
between the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea should worry. Because the wolf and the bear have teamed up. And they are between the wolf and the bear. And in fact, they have a reason to fear it. Because there are secret clauses to the treaty that are later fulfilled. Now, at first, Lithuania is to go to Germany. And Germany is to get the Polish corridor back, and that's it. Stalin will get the rest of Poland, Latvia, and Estonia. Agreements are made between Hitler and Stalin for southeastern Europe as well, to divide it up between them. At the last minute, Stalin demands a change. He does not want the Germans in Lithuania. He wants Lithuania. And in return, he will give Germany the central region of Poland here. Germany will get two-thirds of Poland. Russia will only get the eastern third. Hitler goes along with it. Because with Stalin on his side, Hitler can't lose in Poland. Because he knows something. He knows what the Russians are going to do in Poland. On the night of August 30, 30 days have September, April, June, and November, on the night of August 31st, 1939, Polish soldiers, <clears throat> German concentration camp victims in Polish uniforms, are shot while attacking a German radio station on the border of Poland. These Polish soldiers, <clears throat> German concentration camp victims in Polish uniforms, are killed on German soil as evidence of a Polish attack on Germany. So this attack by Polish soldiers, <clears throat> German concentration camp victims in Polish uniforms is a pretext for war because the Germans, who just happen to have all of their military in Slovakia, in Silesia, in East Prussia, ready to invade. It just so happens. The Poles picked a lousy time to attack that radio station with a couple dozen guys who all got killed. So the Germans, doo, 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 September 1st, 1939, roll into Poland. On September 1st, 1939, Poland calls England and says, we're being invaded. Help us. Please. Chamberlain dithers for two whole days. Churchill is begging him to follow his promise and declare war. Other Brits, including supporters of Chamberlain, are demanding that if he wants to stay prime minister, he better damn well follow his word and declare war. Chamberlain is still trying to find a way to appease Hitler. Meanwhile, the Poles begin to get... Sh the Air Force of Poland is destroyed within the first few hours, mostly on the ground. And Poles are left to fight tanks with lancers. That's horsemen with lances. Just like in Ethiopia, except in Polish forests and fields. Finally, on September 3rd, 1939, Neville Chamberlain declares war. And I'll play that declaration for you in a moment. So the Poles think, okay, Britain and France, as France follows suit, have finally declared war on September 3rd, 1939. The Poles can hold out until the 21st. Their job is to set up a defensive line, hopefully to protect Warsaw, and to pull the army back away from German attacks so that they can hold in eastern Poland while Britain and France does something to attack Germany and draw its forces away. That is the Polish battle plan. 
Unfortunately for Poland, the um, British bombed Germany with leaflets saying, naughty, naughty Germans, you should pull out of Poland. Leaflets. The French, reluctantly, I might point out, man the Maginot fortifications and hung her down. In effect, the West does nothing. And ironically, on the 21st of September, when the Poles expected some definitive action from the West, what actually happens is the Soviet Union invades them from the East. So Poland is a nice sandwich between the two totalitarian powers, and it's slurped up within a five weeks. Hmm? Yeah, bye-bye. At least for a while. Bye-bye free Poland until the 1990s. So, war desperately desired by no one except Hitler. And he, not even Hitler. Hitler honestly didn't really expect the Western powers to declare war. His read of Chamberlain was that Chamberlain would do anything to avoid war. He was surprised. And had it been left to Chamberlain, that's probably true that Germany wouldn't have gone to war. So I'm going to play a couple of things for you, including Chamber Chamberlain's declaration. You at home, I'll try to have attachments for you. Expect an exam tomorrow. Oh, and study your maps. That map and the map of aggression in Asia that I gave you in particular. Thank you.